Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this Kwame Tech Talk, Future Proofing the Supply Chain, Examining Raw Material Supply. Uh, we're delighted to have you um, joining us today, bringing together insights from across the break bulk and Kwame communities. Um, in this first session, we'll be discussing future proofing the metal supply chain, av availability, price and logistics. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to go over a couple of housekeeping points for this session. Uh, the webinar will be available on demand after the session as I know it's a question quite often asked. Uh, pardon me. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A tab uh, on the right-hand side, and we will share them with the speaker and do our best to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, I will now hand you over to our moderator for the session, uh, Chris Gerber, who will introduce the session and the speakers. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Cornell. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Gerber. I'm the managing partner of Genesis Consulting a boutique consulting firm focused on the energy sector based in Belgium and have held several senior executive and board positions in the energy as well as the transport industries. I'm a board advisor to the German and US-based power technology research company, one of the leading, if not the leading private and commercial research companies in the energy-related industry. I will be your moderator for the webinar of today proudly presented and hosted by Hive on behalf of Coil Winding Global and Break Bulk, both internationally recognized as groundbreaking leaders in supply chain exhibition and conference and event. The combined efforts of Break Bulk and Coil Winding aim not to only identify challenges, but facilitate debate and through the exchange of ideas, facilitate business solutions to the numerous operational and strategic challenges faced in our new COVID reality. Our topic for today is future proving the metals supply chain availability, price and logistics. It will deal with the supply and logistic challenges all over the past few years and through the bait and the exchange of information offer not only understanding, but also possible solutions. Please join me in introducing and welcoming our distinguished panelists and specialists, Tim Killen from the Dura Group, Philip Damas from Drury Shipping Consultants, Carsten Wendt from the Valenius Willems Group, and then of course, Cornell Rogers uh, from Hive. Uh, our program will consist of three short power presentations, augmented by narratives, and then we will allow for some questions and answers. We will have a time limit, but we will endeavor to answer most, if not all, of the questions you put to the panel. Please use the relevant chat box to submit your questions. And with this, over to our first speaker, Tim. Tim is the Executive Vice President of the London-based Dura Group. He holds an, 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 an honors degree in mechanical engineering and joined Dura in 2012. He is a member of the Duro Group Executive Board, and Tim is responsible for the strategic industry sales and tendering activities. Having worked for more than 24 years in various senior management capacities, and having worked in various energy-related industry verticals, his global experience makes him the ideal for our panel discussion today. With this, Tim, over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Chris, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, the Doigo Group was founded in 1924, and in two years, we're going to celebrate our 100-year anniversary. We're a privately owned organization of global logistics specialists focusing on providing value-driven technical logistics solutions to the energy industry. Our team comprises of more than 1,400 people, over 75 officers across the world, and we really believe it's important that we understand our clients' challenges so that we can provide tailor-made solutions to meet their needs. Within the group, as you can see on the slide pack, uh, we have four companies. Doigoro Freight Forwarding is the largest and longest established business in the group. Uh, D-Ship was set up in 2015 and is an ocean carrier, now owning and operating a fleet of more than 20 multi-purpose freight book vessels. DTEC was established in 2011 and is an independent technical and transport engineering company with a global team of technical experts providing clients with front-end solution design and operational assurance for all their logistics needs. And D-Haulage owns and operates a dedicated fleet of specialist onshore heavy haul and heavy lift equipment. Now getting into the, the topic today of the supply chain challenges that we face in this industry. 
Recently, Ernst & Young conducted a COVID impact survey, and only 2% of companies who responded said they were fully prepared for the pandemic. Serious disruptions affected 57% of companies, whilst 72% reported negative effects. I think we can all agree these are startling, but yet realistic facts. Historically, during uncertain economic environments, many companies have slowed down their technology investments. But throughout COVID, the majority of organizations canvassed continued investment in technology. And I really think this demonstrates the value and reliance that industry now sees in supply chain digitalization tools to navigate volatile supply and demand. The last two years have created tangible opportunities for some industries. With increased customer demand and the production of new healthcare products such as PPE, COVID-19 tests and vaccines, whilst we also saw essential consumer products were in high demand, especially in the early days of the pandemic. But some traditional manufacturing sectors were hit very hard by the pandemic. Automotives, garments, industri industrial manufacturing, just as some examples, have been impacted significantly due to su severe supply chain challenges increased commodity costs, global financing issues, and changes in consumer spending. Whilst the global employment industry, which is ever so important, has also been impacted, which if we don't tackle this, could leave us facing major capacity and competence gaps with our employees in the future. If, if we look at the whole supply chain and logistics environment, approximately 90% of the world trade includes movement by sea. Today, the lack of capacity, availability, and predictability on all types of ocean vessels and also aircraft really remains a major issue across the global industry, with shipments of cargo being integral to support manufacturing, retail, healthcare, and industrial projects as an example. But how did this start and what does it mean going forward? When the pandemic commenced in 2020, this resulted in manufacturing, port facilities and project sites being closed down. Ocean freight capacity and schedules were immediately impacted, meaning that vessel fleets, which usually perform like clockwork on rotational port calls, were left out of sync in terms of their location, their equipment availability and manpower, along with being able to redefine their scheduling. As the pandemic went on, retail continued to soar, essential manufacturing then recommenced, but global procurement patterns and customer needs changed significantly. The resulting new consumer needs and manufacturing requirements meant that supply chain patterns and logistics demands had changed, with vessels out of position, ports closed or working on reduced capacity, and skilled personnel at a premium this meant the global industry needed to deal with both a significant increase in cost and risk, while supply chain visibility, efficiency reduced to an all-time low. In addition to this, the already exceptionally challenging global logistics market, in March 21, we saw the Ever Given container vessel block the Suez Canal for almost a week. This held up approximately 9.6 billion dollars of trade along the Suez Canal each day, equating to around 400 million and 3.3 million tons of cargo an hour. All of this meant shippers had to deal with greatly increased risk in terms of predictability on cost, schedule and efficiency. And this was the new normal. No one had predicted it and few had prepared for it. The pandemic seriously impacted ocean carriers and airlines who were at the front end of the change management curve. Space availability immediately became a challenge with vessels out of position and cargo demands returning with a bang. Immediately, there was a lack of availability and capacity in most vessel and aircraft types as asset owners tried to realign their fleets and their crews to the new normal. Shipping costs have increased significantly in the last two years and that's impacted us all. We're now looking at an average of at least four or five times higher costs than pre-pandemic levels. Looking at the market today, we hope that shipping costs will level out in 2022, but it's realistic that they may never return to where they were from a pre-pandemic level.
Availability of space on vessels continues to worsen, along with service and schedule performance remaining poor in general. High levels of port congestion continue, meaning even once cargo is finally loaded onto a vessel, ocean transit times are taking much longer than before. One example of this is once a container is loaded on a vessel in China to the US, it can take an average of 80 days to arrive in the States, almost double the pre-pandemic shipping duration. Major ports throughout China and the USA continue to face on-off lockdowns, reduced productivity, meaning it takes a lot longer to discharge and reload vessels. Ports and warehousing are congested, creating bottlenecks and significant lack of capacity to store cargo. And even once cargo is finally discharged at its port of destination, there's huge pressure on trying to customs clear and deliver cargo to owners as soon as possible to delay, to reduce further delays. But in addition to this, the trucking and rail industry are also heavily impacted, leaving cargo delayed in warehouses, waiting for haulage equipment and manpower to be able to deliver to the final customer. Driver and equipment shortages are the new reality. An example of this is in the UK where I uh, live, it's estimated the road haulage sector has seen a shortage of around 100,000 qualified drivers. There's a number of reasons for this. Approximately 15,000 European drivers are believed to have left the UK post-Brexit, along with another 15,000 missed or postponed uh, HGV tests. And also, as we've seen across the industry, you know, a lot of, uh, of individuals who have the key skills that are needed have decided to take retirement during uh, the pandemic. Global supply chains are complex and contain many moving parts, involving multiple vendors all over the world, producing key components to support the manufacturing process. Whether it's an automobile or a complex electrical component, each of these items requires hundreds or even thousands of individual items and in inventory to be available at the same time. The cost of procurement of key materials such as steel and copper wiring, valves, pipes, and even electronic chips have increased significantly in the last two years. And each component has its own individual inbound and outbound supply chain to be managed. So to react to this supply chain challenges, it's essential the entire supply chains are mapped and risk assessed to ensure that key components needed to support manufacturing projects can be sourced securely and contingency needs to be inbuilt. Diversifying and de-risking supply chain strategies, looking at both global and local landscapes, is very important. I think redesigning around the new normal can provide the new generation of supply chains with better visibility, more predictability, and also um, contingency in all key aspects, which is a major challenge at a time when supply chain cost, availability and security is under the microscope, as we also face the risk of hyperinflation. As we come to the end of, uh, of, of my section at the moment, I'd like to give you a quote from John F. Kennedy. He said, change is the law of life and those who only look at the past or present are certain to miss the future. I'm sure Carsten will cover the ocean freight carrier market in more detail uh, in his content, but it's true to say the COVID pandemic has forced change into many aspects of our life and work. Even though we face some significant challenges across our industry, we have already started to adapt and innovate. To support a sustainable future, stakeholders across global supply chains are working together to reimagine the strategic architecture of supply chain and logistics solutions. Continuing to develop digitalization tools to support smart volume forecasting and to improve visibility and predictability, de-risking procurement strategies, increasing vessel booking notice periods and de-bottlenecking trade lane volumes. Really, designing supply chains with more efficiency, agility, and contingency will improve supply chain risk and resilience. This is a challenging time, and it's going to be a long journey. But this discussion today is key, and it's important that we continue to invest in the future of all aspects of supply chain technology, processes, and very importantly, continue to train our skilled workforces. That's the end of my section. and. Uh, I'll pass back to Chris. Thank you. 
Tim, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. Um, and no doubt there would be a, a sizable amount of questions uh, coming to you following uh, your introduction and your your uh, presentation. Much appreciated for that. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Philip. Philip is the head. Uh, Philip Damas is the head and executive in charge of the Drury Supply Chain Advisors, the logistic practice of the Drury Group. He is a managing director of Drury Shipping Consultants. He has a distinguished career in shipping logistics and air freight forwarding management and consultancy and has worked for the likes of, of American Shipper and Containerization International, COBRA, the International Shipping Consortium, CMA, CGM, and Compare Data. He is the author and highly sought after presenter of papers at conferences in Asia, the United States, and Europe. Philip holds an MBA from the University of Bradford Management Center and a BSc and MSc in Finance from the University of Strasbourg. Philip, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Chris, and hello, everybody. So following Tim's presentation, I will pick up some of the themes on uh, disruption and supply chain issues to look in particular at the tangible impact on customers, on importers and exporters, and what some of them are doing about it. And I will base uh, this, these ideas, this insight, uh, on some of the discussions we have with uh, our many uh, exporter-importer customers for example, I will share a survey we've done on the 100 multinationals related to the uh, crisis. So first of all, I wanted to have a look at what are the actual um, supply chain performance issues. And this is a slide showing what's happening in the container shipping sector. We know there's breakable cargo moving between breakable ships and containers or between a rural ships and containers. On the container side, it's a complete crisis, as you can see. On the top left here, you can see the number of container ships waiting at anchor in the port of New York. So already uh, last year, that's the orange line, was much higher than 2020. And first week of 2022, which is the dark blue uh, circle there, is way above what happened the last two years. So a very significant port congestion issue in container ships and in some other shipping sectors. Top right, you can see that this is having a significant impact on the reliability or timeliness of uh, schedules. So already last year, um, and these are 2020-21 numbers, already in 2020, only 60% of the container ships arrived on the time of scheduled arrival, the ETA. Now it's down to 30%. So frankly, you should expect most of your containerized shipments to arrive late. That's the rule now. Bottom left, you can see other metrics. There are problems with asset velocity. Asset velocity is much slower than it was in the past, creating shortages. And then uh, average voyage delays are three times approximately what they used to be. And the result, as Tim mentioned, is we are seeing some hyperinflation, I call it, in the freight rates. So here, this is for the container sector. In the past year, the uh, Drury World Container Index is up 80%. And the year before that, I think it went up by 150%. So unprecedented and really, really uh, uh, an affordable freight cost for many importers. So to sum up, this COVID-19 crisis has affected all these different areas of the transport maritime infrastructure in different areas. So lower transport capacity, sometimes the containers of the ship are in the wrong place, port closures, port congestion, and hugely inflating shipping costs. So what does it mean for importers, exporters? So we've done a survey of, uh, within our Drury Benchmarking Club we have more than 100 multinationals exchanging best practices and views on the market and uh, monitoring their freight costs. And so we asked all of our customers, what are their current issues? And you can see the bar charts, the bar charts, the 
bars on the right show you when it's a difficult or serious issue. And you can see lack of shipping capacity is serious or difficult for 90% of the companies. Lack of scheduleability, same. Frankly, uh, it's a, this is a no now. Higher freight costs, a big issue for everybody. And then um, you also have problems with surcharges or off-contract costs. You also have problems with demurrage costs. Uh, a lot of problems related to operations is starting to feed into the financial side and into penalties, contractual penalties. And then uh, on the right, you also have problems even getting your booking accepted is getting difficult. In the past, it was the carriers, the shipping companies waiting for the bookings. Now it's more the exporters, importers, or forwarders waiting for the booking from the carrier, for the ship owner. So clearly, based on this survey, there are some significant tangible implications, mainly negative implications for importers, exporters, that we will have to live with, frankly, probably for another year. So that will, I'll cover this next. But so the issues that will continue to occur are high pressure on logistics staff. Frankly, if you work in logistics today, you have a really difficult, terrible job. So well done if you keep at it. There are problems with stock out, excessive logistics spend, very difficult to justify to your senior leadership. Also, uh, you know, some of our customers are really struggling with this. Increased consumer prices. Now, I think this is feeding into product inflation, which is in the economic headlines too. In some cases, the freight costs are so high that some of customers are discontinuing the production of low value goods. And then um, a point that Tim mentioned earlier, many companies are starting to look at their overall supply chains, trying to see whether it makes sense to continue given that the previous assumptions on relatively low shipping costs have gone. So I wanted to share with you some guidance and ideas on what will happen next, try to make this a bit more constructive instead of just saying that everything is chaotic. So uh, first of all, at least in container shipping, and I think also uh, bread bulk shipping, the shipping delays and congestion and elevated freight rates will continue for another year, which means that if you're importer or exporter, you must look at planning for another year and look at alternatives. So alternative transport modes, you know, can you move from bulk bulk ships to Roro? Can you move from Roro to containers or to air freight or to rail in some cases? Look at alternative ports of entry try to avoid the most congested hotspots, look at alternative transport providers. And in some cases, you may realize because the lead times are so long, you need to build up inventory as destination and certainly allow much more time for you know, to move your products. In some cases, we are seeing companies do sort of do-it-yourself alternatives, which is chartering your own ship. I'm not sure how effective this is, but this is to me, quite a desperate measure, which implies that they do not believe that the commercial providers are doing enough and they need to find their own alternatives. And then looking for uh, planning for further disruptions, I think it's important if you're involved in supply chain management and transportation to plan for higher costs, plan for more logistics disruptions, and do a number of activities, some of which Tim mentioned, like uh, you know, looking at risk assessment, having a business continuity plan and the like. And as a logistics consultant, we advise companies in this area. And then uh, another point, looking at the medium term is looking again at your supply chain and considering your sourcing locations. We're starting to talk more and more now does it make sense to import from China if it takes you know, 60 days and $10,000? Or should you move that production to Turkey or North Africa or Eastern Europe and the like? Also, exporters and importers must review a number of key areas. So uneconomic products, 
uh, increase delivered product prices, maybe it's time to pass on some of these costs to your customers, and a number of new strategic ways of doing business like multi-year transport contracts or how to secure shipping capacity. Now there's the concept of becoming a, a shipper of choice, uh, which means you try to become a really attractive customer for the ship owners uh, to secure the scarce capacity. And that's it for me. So if you have any questions, uh, either now or later, please feel to contact me. And uh, this is the end of my part of the presentation. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very insightful. Uh, I think very important comments uh, there, Philip, in the sense of what are the alternatives? Uh, looking at different modes of transport, uh, different ports and in infrastructure, looking at your, your sourcing uh, and, and, and the regionality importance thereof and also inventory levels. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, indeed, uh, very, very important comments there. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Carsten Vent. Carsten is the senior executive and heads up the high and heavy and break bog sales division for Valenius Willems Ocean, uh, the German branch located in Bremen. The uh, Valenius Willemsen group is considered one of the leading row row and break bulk carriers with more than 130 vessels operating in a fixed liner network. Their combination of technical expertise, experience, skill and break bulk, technical and equipment enables them to handle specialized cargo up to 6.5 meters tall, weighing up to 400 tons. Within the global industry account team of Alenius, uh, Carsten drives and supports the global break bulk activities, and this enables him with some unique and specialized insights on international trade, transport, and logistic patterns. He studied international transport management at Germany's University of Applied Sciences in Oldenburg, uh, Willemshaven, and Ostfriesland. And as part of his studies, he was fortunate enough to spend six months at Hong at the Hong Kong Polytechnic studying international shipping and logistics. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I give you uh, Carsten. Carsten, over to you. Thanks, Chris, for your kind introduction. So a very good afternoon to everyone. So um, I want to pick up a few uh, topics and items uh, which Tim and um, Philip already mentioned. And um, Philip said something interesting. Uh, logistics uh, became very important over the past months and years. And I just want to recall, often logistics was seen as a given. So nobody really bothered. It was just about getting it cheaper. And I would say capacity was always available. So nobody really in a production chain bothered too much about logistics. And uh, this has certainly changed in 2021 uh, because it became, I would say, a crucial part of, let's say, delivering or let's say even producing products and delivering them to the final customer. So that's why the topic here really is all eyes on ocean freight. Uh, also, Tim said it right, 90% of the cargoes are being transported. And I mean, we are talking here uh, inbound logistics of pre-manufactured or raw materials as well as the finished goods. So I will run you uh, through uh, a few items here, especially in the shipping world, what has happened over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And some of the, uh, them you've heard already, others might be new, but I also just want to tell you that this is not only, uh, yeah, let's say, buzzwords. It's also, uh, I will show you in a second that this is also happening in a daily level. So let's start with the top left uh, equipment uh, imbalance. How did this happen? Just real quick here, uh, the container lines, they uh, started to order many, many new containers. And some people might think, OK, uh, why did this happen and, and what went wrong? Uh, just very quick, uh, so usually when you talk about container capacities, you say that you need for one slot on, on the vessel, you need three containers. Why do you need three containers? One sits on the vessel, one is at the loading port, one is at the discharge port. So the, the ratio is one to three. In reality, the container lines, and I would say most of the container lines, nobody had this one to three ratio. 
uh, the best ratio some of them had was 2.2, others even were below two. So even post COVID days, there was an undercapacity of containers in the market, but it didn't really matter too much because I mean, there was capacity available, so nobody really bothered. But when um, when the crisis hit, or let's say the demand increased, this shortage became apparent. So now the container lines, and I just put put out now one example of Hapagloid, they ordered a tremendous amount of containers. Hapagloid alone ordered 625,000 uh, contain containers in 2021. Uh, and uh, as all of you are aware by, uh, let's say, not only that the prices for the containers are uh, increasing, but also the lead times to produce these boxes are quite long. So you can imagine that it will not only be delivered, they will be delivered only over the next years to come. Yeah, so container shortage is definitely one of the problems. Then capacity limitations. Simply, there were not enough vessels in the market. So what happened in 2020 when COVID hit, first a lot of uh, container vessels were put up uh, for um, layups. And then let's say demand came back much bigger than everyone expected. Uh, maybe we have a little bit of time later in the group to discuss, I mean, why has this demand came, why did it come so, uh, why was it so, so huge or let's say what did it come back so rapidly and in 2021 there were uh, there's an order book of container vessels in particular of 619 vessels and out of those 619 381 have been ordered only in 2021 and it just so basically it's more than 50 percent of the total order book uh, happened in 2021 and again here it's a similar situation than with the containers once you order today, you will only get delivery of these vessels in 2023, 2024 onwards. So, and that's a little bit what Philip said earlier, the situation is likely to continue throughout 2022 unless there's more capacity delivered. Labor shortage or labor limitations. I mean, we have labor limitations in all kinds of fields. I'm just trying to pick up here now uh, two items. So uh, we shouldn't forget uh, back in Australia, because we were also heavily affected, there was a strike in Fremantle uh, by the port workers, which lasted for 12 weeks, which heavily disrupted the operations. And still today, we are feeling the impact. It's not only in Australia, it's also in other parts of the world. Uh, you see Long Beach over here, they, they had a various struggle in the past years already, but also I'd say contain, uh, let's say labor limitations due to strike, but also COVID related, I will come to that later on, uh, resulted in major delays in ports. I mean, the picture you see here is a picture of Long Beach where uh, about 50 to 70 vessels sometimes, or let's say a time is anchoring and waiting for, uh, for to be discharged. So it's, it's it, I would say yeah, it's, it's a major problem um, to, yeah, yeah, for the container shipping industry. And again, it's, uh, it's, it's really causing a lot of limitations on capacity. And Tim mentioned it, physical disruptions. Um, quite an impressive picture of Ever Given from a uh, satellite picture. Uh, and it's quite, quite amazing, uh, I would say, what can happen if uh, there's a small error navigation, um, what, what this causes and what it means to the world shipping economy, uh, and let's say to the production economy when the vessel blocks the Suez Canal for six days. Yeah, And I would say, luckily, this ended very quickly. But just imagine we have other, uh, let's say, ship channels, uh, let's say, which are very narrow streets, yeah, Street of Gibraltar, Suez Canal, Panama Canal. Yeah, so and uh, the vessels are getting bigger and bigger. So those kind of accidents, uh, they can happen every or any time again yeah so it's just one let's say warning finger who tells us okay uh, look what can happen and don't i mean we will come to that and also later on don't rely too much on uh, on maybe on 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 ocean transportation in your supply chain because uh, basically it shows you what can happen if something goes wrong Rate fluctuations, yeah. Um, also, this was mentioned before, uh, freight rates increased tremendously. And uh, maybe just to give you here uh, two charts, uh, one is the Shanghai Containerized Freight Index. 
it's a combined index of many, many trades. So uh, this varies a bit. But when you look uh, at the trough back in April, May 2020, when COVID hit, uh, the index was about 200,600 points, whereas of uh, 14th of uh, January, a couple of days back, uh, we had a peak of uh, yeah 5,000 points, which is about 95% increase all over the trades. If you go even into particular trade lanes like Asia, Europe or Asia, North America, you have freight increases by 500 to 600%. Yeah? And the good question is, are those increases, are go how do they last or will they last? Uh, and that's a little bit the crystal ball, if you ask me. Uh, it will not go back to uh, previous levels, but it will most likely level out between 50 to 100% of the low levels, uh, you will say, start coming from 2020. Uh, on the right-hand side, just a quick uh, look on, on the multi-purpose industry or the multi-purpose carrier. Uh, same situation here. Uh, I haven't picked up anything here now from the rural industry, our industry, but it's very similar. Uh, what you can say is that a lot of cargoes which can which couldn't be booked by the container lines they over flooded into the multi-purpose industry as well as into the rural industry so basically the, the the demand increased rapidly and also here you see a steep increase in charter rates here which uh, cumul or let's say which is equivalent also to them to the freight rates of one uh, more than 137 percent since october 2020 so Quite impressive number, and um, uh, also here uh, when you see the headline, and I think it's quite interesting. Uh, when I started my career back in 2007, I started right in the peak and in, in one of the ship ship shipping peaks, and everybody told me, "Oh, this is an unseen time. This will never have happen again." And uh, 2021 outperformed 2008 and has even uh, yeah, so has. A, um, outperformed this. So uh, quite amazing to see what happened here. Then we come to unforeseen events, uh, COVID outbreak. You heard from the news, COVID uh, not only, I mean, COVID has a lot of implications to the world supply chains, but let's put it this way, when it comes to the shipping industry, it has a huge effect on, uh, let's say, port congestions, labor availability, and especially in Chinese ports. Why especially in Chinese ports? Because China is having these uh, no COVID strategy. And uh, some of you might remember that we had major challenges in the port of Yantai, in the port of Shenzhen, in the port of Shanghai in 2021, because ports were just closed for more than two to three weeks. And I just picked up a headline just recently about the new Omicron variant, which presents a major challenge to the Chinese government, because with the no COVID strategy, Omicron most likely will uh, will not work. Yeah? And it remains to be seen what this variant will mean to the Chinese government, to its ports, to its production facilities. And I don't want to be too pessimistic, but maybe the worst is just to be seen yeah so uh, maybe we have seen it yet uh, in when, especially when it comes to china so just be prepared over the next weeks and months uh, it could be much worse uh, than what we have seen today okay so just to look a little bit back what hap uh, what, what happened and maybe a little outline okay uh, into the future also when it comes to supply chains uh, what will be trends, or what could be, uh, yeah, or what could, what what could be done? First of all, tracking visibility becomes very very important, especially if you don't know where your cargo is. So that's an increasing demand by shippers uh, um, to to see where their cargo is. I think it's it's super important for uh, production planning for ship uh, for for anything you do that you have to have full visibility on where your products are at the moment. Risk assessment. Um, we talked about it, uh, let's say, being re, uh, being reliant only on one mode of transport, for example, being reliant on only one or few uh, suppliers overseas. Yeah. So I showed you what happens or what happened in the Suez Canal, or we talked about congestions and ports and major delays. So I think every 
everyone has to really do a proper risk assessment and what will it mean to my production line? What will it mean, mean to my lead time, uh, bringing my products to customers? And how can I be more independent from certain modes of transport or even, um, let's say, sourcing areas? Alternative transportation. Uh, we have seen this in 2021. Uh, customers uh, changed uh, from uh, ocean transportation into rail transportation from China. Of course, this has also its limitations, but it is one part, let's say, to reduce the risk from ocean transportation. So also this is a field probably where still a lot of room for development. Local sourcing production. Uh, yeah, I would say the majority of cargoes we see these days also in the metal industry is being produced in China or in Asia in particular. Um, so um, most likely we will see a, sh a shift back to more local or regional production uh, like near, shore, uh, yeah, near sourcing. Uh, and it will not move back entirely, let's say, when we see it uh, from the eyes from the US or like from a, from a US eye or a European eye, but certain parts of, let's say, certain, uh, a certain share of production will certainly uh, will move back uh, closer where you are in more independent from, from ocean transportation or other modes of transport. And last but not least, increased stock levels, especially with these unpredictable sailing times and delivery times, it is required to increase stock levels, which certainly has an impact on, uh, yeah, on, 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 on money. Uh, as it as it will, uh, your inventory stock costs will increase. On the other hand, it, it also gives you some room to breathe, uh, yeah, to go forward. So that was it from my side a little bit, just a little uh, snapshot of what happened on 2021 and also how we will go on from here in 2022 and onwards. Back to Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, very insightful. Uh, very, very important points made, and I uh, will come back to this in the conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a time for your questions, and I would like again to reiterate the opportunity is available uh, to approach through the current platform and the chat box our experts for today. Uh, I already have six questions, uh, which I would pose to Tim, Philip, and Carsten. Uh, Tim, the first question is for you. Uh, with industry facing supply chain and logistic challenges, how can industry better prepare? Uh, some of the subsequent speakers to you have reflected on some of the elements, but what are your thoughts on this? Oh, thanks, Chris. I appreciate the question. As you saw earlier in my slide pack, you know, I, I like uh, a good quote now and again. Uh, and I think a very good one from Benjamin Franklin was, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Uh, and I think that's very important, you know, with regard to this question. You know, things have significantly changed across global supply chains and the logistics industry in the last two years. And we've spent a lot of time reacting to those changes. I think, however, now, you know, two years down the road, we're a lot more experienced, hopefully a little bit wiser as well. Uh, so we need to use this learning in order to look at the processes and, and the systems and, and deal with the challenges that we've been faced in order to improve. You know, continuing to do the, the, the same things that we did before, you know, two, three, five years ago, it, it's really not an option. Um, you know, we need to look at how we can manage down risk and cost, you know, improve contingency. So what, what I've found in, and what we've spent a lot of time on in the last 12 months is engaging with our clients, having a lot more early discussion and more detailed engagement than ever before when it comes to you know, supply chain and logistics delivery, you know, better visibility, improved planning, trying to you know, define more predictability uh, you know, in all modes of transport which are affected talking with vendors, manufacturers, end clients, and also, you know, logistics asset owners and, and providers to be able to design new solutions, put in, in place new processes, um, and deal with the new normal. You know, I think in addition to that, and as we discussed before, I think digitalization is going to be hugely important in supporting this task going forward. Uh, 
in terms of visibility and predictability, um, as well as you know the importance to challenge historical processes and, and redefining new ones. So I think the message is very much about planning, it's about early engagement, and it's about having those conversations and reviewing what's been done before and looking at how it can be done differently in the future. Tim, thank you very much. Very comprehensive insight and, and response. Thank you very much. The next question I have uh, is to Philip. Uh, Philip, you reflected uh, in your narrative on port congestion. A question in this regard, uh, who will be able to fix the current port and shipping bottlenecks? Your thoughts on this, please. Philip, you're, you're still on mute. That's it. Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, clearly, many importers and exporters are asking how long will the current bottlenecks last and what needs to happen for this to be fixed. And I'm afraid that our view at Drury is that you need the involvement of many different stakeholders and you need uh, many different programs to be implemented to get anywhere near a resolution of the bottlenecks. So you will need to have the ports involved, the port communities even, including the local forwarding community and steep drawing community. You need to have the ship owners involved. You need to have policy makers. For example, the question that was mentioned on China having a zero tolerance policy Frankly, as long as China has a zero tolerance policy on COVID, there will be significant bottlenecks in China. So I think if there's anybody from the Chinese government watching this program, you need to act on this because this is just not sustainable. So, and then uh, the exporters, importers also need, frankly, to perhaps have low expectations that these things can be resolved quickly. I'm afraid there's no easy solution, in my view, on, on the shipping bottlenecks. Philip, thank you very much. Uh, a question uh, to Carsten. Uh, in our narrative session this afternoon, we actually addressed some of this. Uh, how long are we expecting this situation to last? And very importantly, um, have we reached a peak yet? Your thoughts on this, Carsten? Well, if you had asked me the question about reaching the peak back in November, December, I would have said, yes, of course, we reached the peak, so it couldn't go any further than this. But uh, I have to say, fortunately, unfortunately, it depends a little bit wherever you sit, you still see an increasing trend in some of the uh, shipping markets. So, and uh, you've seen the chart of the Shanghai uh, containerized uh, freight index, yeah? So it's maybe it's it's becoming a little bit flatter but still it's increasing and um, so maybe we have reached now a plateau so i don't expect any uh, steep increase yet but also this is likely to last all the way until 2022 and and the reason why why is it still lasting for the whole of 2022 i mentioned that already earlier it's simply it will only change if you will bring in additional capacity in the container market. And that's only likely to happen uh, in 2023. So when new vessels will come in, some of them, of course, will replace uh, older tonnage, but then you will see a little bit uh, of a relief in the supply and demand. Additionally, and also that's another topic here, what we have seen is that uh, sourcing habits will change. So uh, especially in the consumption industry, yeah, consumer industry, uh, there is the value of a good, yeah, uh, basically uh, is very low value. And when you see what you have to pay for the transportation costs to ship it from China to Europe, for example, yeah, uh, those kind of goods, they will not be uh, imported from China anymore. Yeah? Either they will be stopped uh, imported or you will try to buy them lo locally. So this will definitely um, um, have an impact, let's say, on the overall cargo volume being in the market. Uh, so, But it just will take a little bit of time uh, until this kicks in. So uh, yeah, well, well into 2022 situation remains unchanged and then maybe a little relief uh, beginning 2023. Carsten, thank you very much. Um, 
Another topic which we addressed was hyperinflation. Uh, Tim, a question for you. Uh, how do you think and what are your thoughts on how companies should best prepare financially and budget for the future when it comes to supply chain logistics costing? I think we've discussed, you know, uh, across this um, this webinar today that, you know, the cost of raw materials and, and the cost of logistics in the supply chain has increased significantly. And and that's the reality, you know, with, with you know, with shipping costs, you know, somewhere between five and six times more than they were previously, you know, the cost is hugely different than it was before. And we've had a lot of difficult discussions with with customers and, and shippers over the last sort of 12 to 24 months i think what's important now is to understand that you know the volatility is there and and, and shipping costs are significantly increased and you know where it's going to go you know we, we don't know obviously carsten and philip have, have given some opinion on that so it's really going back to you know my earlier response it's about early engagement it's be about willing to maybe um you know manage logistics budgets differently from before you know a lot of uh, logistics costs are delivered on fixed price and it's looking to see how we can put some um some risk mitigation in there in order to take for cost increases as well as cost decreases so looking at different contracting strategies having more transparency across the supply chain between partners so you know if efficiencies and cost reductions can be achieved passing that back to customers as well so it's really you know it's back to the, you know a similar response that i gave previously it's about trying to to work together with customers to better plan have better visibility and then making sure that the logistics budgets are, are realistic but you know it's a big challenge uh, and it's one that will impact across i think all different industries both in terms of cost and availability of tonnage in order to be able to move equipment so early engagement is 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 crucial and being realistic when it comes to budgets and schedules yeah tim perhaps just to follow up comment and question in terms of of the early engagement principle uh, would paying in advance for your freight and your logistic services uh, contribute to a, a more friendly budget or a more a, a, a better planning in terms of budget and expenditure? What are your thoughts on this? I think committing to volumes, um, you know, I think is important. I think we can see in the contract logistics industry, um, you know, if you have a regular supply chain of product moving from, you know, a, an origin country to a destination and you can guarantee to have a commitment of, you know, 25 containers a month or a certain volume on a break book vessel, I think that uh, can be there. In terms of, of upfront payment, you know, I think, you know, payment terms generally are, you know, are not so much of an issue because, you know, they're, they're led by the carrier anyway. It's more about that predictability and commitment to say we're definitely going to ship you know x volume each month from origin a to destination b over a longer period of time to be able to secure the supply um, rather than waiting until you're 100 certain that the commodity is going to be ready to ship because availability lead times now are much much longer than before you know being able to book space on a ship for next week or the week after that's not the reality you know you, you must okay. plan you know, four, eight, even 12 weeks in advance for a container and then even longer if you've got more complex cargoes. Thank you very much. Uh, qu question for you, Philip, um, amongst and alongst similar lines, do exporters and importers have any power to mitigate logistic delays and high costs? So it joins to a certain extent uh, the previous question uh, posed to Tim. Your thoughts, please. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So uh, I think many importers nowadays will feel they have no power because the logistics delays are imposed on them. There are fewer alternatives. There's not spare capacity and the costs, costs keep going up and up and up. But I would say there's still some opportunity to try to at least control or limit these negative changes. So one of them is, uh, for example, trying to become what is known as a ship of choice. It means that you will, uh, it's a reverse proposition of what happened in the past, where in the past the ship owners or forwarders were trying to line their way of working with their customers. Now, 
it's a customer who has to align the way they work. For example, in capacity, you have to provide much better forecast to your transport providers. You have to uh, think of how you communicate with them better. You have to pay your bills on time if you want to get the capacity. We are talking about payment terms. So I think uh, this idea that you have to develop much better and stronger relationships with transport providers that will put you at the front of the queue when there are all these uh, problems of logistics delays. And then you have to, to plan earlier. And certainly not look at alternatives and have backup plans and contingency plans. So it, it's, it's getting harder and more complex, but I, I would encourage importers to, to look at these areas. At least you can say, oh, we, we are in a difficult market, but we try to do our best. Fully understood. Fully understood. Um, a question uh, um, for Carsten. Um, Carsten, what are your views in terms of the ocean and the sea freight industry? Uh, how, uh, what needs to happen to ensure a better, better balance in supply and demand again? Uh, we've touched on some of the elements, but uh, we, we, we reflected on port congestion. Uh, we, we reflected on new vessels and more containers. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think um, usually shipping uh, or shipping markets go in cycles. So it's like usually you order vessels when you have a high demand in, in cargoes. And once the vessels, they uh, come into pin to place, the demand is uh, low again. So and then the freight rates are, are bad. So this is just uh, yeah always uh, going into opposite direction. So I think the, the goal should be to maybe to synchronize this uh, demand and supply. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think it's, it should be in uh, everybody's interest and in, or in all interest that um, freight rates are predictable. And uh, also, uh, I think that's that's what we all need um, in the industry, that, uh, that you are planning, that you have a reliable uh, freight, freight rate level, uh, cost for transportation. Yeah. So, and... Uh, yeah, it's very difficult um, uh, to predict what the demand side will tell in 2023 when all these vessels will come again into the market. Will it still be on that high level or will we see a huge drop? I mean, there was one, maybe just to touch here real quick, there was one question uh, from the audience about uh, why did this demand come so back so rapidly? I think back in 2020 when COVID hit in April, uh, n including myself, nobody had foreseen this huge demand in products, uh, which will which hit us in 2021. And maybe just to touch upon a few reasons for it, I mean, look at the car side. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people bought, uh, started to buy cars because they found cars suddenly. Uh, I would say a safer mode of uh, traveling. Let's say going to work, uh, not using transfer public transportation too much to avoid uh, the crowd, yeah, because of Corona. So Corona basically had a tremendous impact on the car industry. Same goes for the uh, evolution of electric vehicles, yeah. So that a lot of people, let's say even governments, they stimulated, um, let's say, buying electric vehicles and supported this by uh, subsidies. Yeah. Again, this made a huge push for the car industry. And then what happened is that you had a sudden uh, shortage of micro uh, chips. Yeah. And now you you sit on this high order book of cars and you cannot produce them and uh, they will all come. And then they will call the cut, uh, the, let's say the catch up uh, bottle effect. Uh, so it will come then eventually, but at, all at once. Yeah. And then again, it, it, it's creating a major problem in supply and demand again. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it, it is uh, a real challenge these days, and I think we just have to manage the situation as best as we can, yeah, because it's not going to improve over the next month. So we, we will have to live with this for the next, yeah, maybe even years. Thank you very much for the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we are fast approaching the hour. Uh, if there are no new and additional questions from the floor, I would like to summarize and and conclude. I think this afternoon we not only 
identified and reflected on the challenges faced by the transport, shipping, freight and logistics industry. Our panel of experts enabled a discussion and a debate this afternoon, facilitated an exchange of ideas. It reflected on mitigating strategies, short and medium term. And I have no doubt that this will enable our attendees and participants this afternoon to formulate new business solutions to the numerous operational and strategic challenges faced in our new COVID reality. We have spoken about hyperinflation. We have spoken to infrastructure changes, changes required in terms of investment within the industries, but also alternatively sourcing. I want to conclude by thanking our panel. Um, uh, very, very insightful, clearly knowledgeable, and also our host this afternoon, Hive, uh, and uh, Coil Winding Global, as well as their partners, Breakbulk, for making this possible. Um, before I sign off, uh, Tim, any concluding remarks on your side? No, I'd just like to say uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to discuss this today. It's a very important topic and one we need to continue dialogue on. So thank you. Philip, any thoughts on your side? No, same. Very good panel. Thanks for inviting me and good discussion. Thank you. And then lastly, over to you. Perfect. Uh, sorry if we're going to pass the cast in, but thank you so much, Chris, uh, for your expert uh, moderation. I can tell you've done this a few times before. Um, and to, to Tim, Carsten and Philip for delivering such an insightful and cohesive session. Um, it's much appreciated. There's a few questions that we didn't get around to answering in the Q&A tab, um, but I'm sure the speakers will be able to answer them uh, at a later date. So I'll post them to them at a later date. Um, but thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Before we sign off, uh, Carsten, any any thoughts on your side? No, thanks for for having me here. It's quite an interesting uh, mode or forum, also to combine, let's say, uh, our shipping view with uh, with the yeah, with the, with the production audience. So I think it's it's is a great idea. So and we should entertain this uh, even more in the future. So looking forward to it. I think it's uh, it's very beneficial, I guess, for both sides. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to thank you, uh, Cornell, also on, uh, on behalf of the panelists and myself. Thank you for facilitating this and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Cheers, guys.